I think as I was speaking to someone before, we should lower the expectations so that. But we're talking about Tayar, religion and science, creation and evolution. I don't know what your own background might be with respect to Tayar de Chardin, but just to say a couple things uh, in terms of his life. He was born in 1881 in France, a French Jesuit priest, a scientist. His field was really paleontology, geology, which is why he became very involved early on in the whole theory of evolution, involved in fact in the discovery in China at one point of a Peking man or Sinanthropus. So he devoted much of his life to trying to integrate faith with science. As a Jesuit priest, obviously a man of great faith, and yet as a scientist, someone who was drawn to take very seriously the discoveries, the fossils, everything that was going on at that time. Uh, died in 1955, actually in uh, New York City. We could say a lot more about his life, but later, if you wish, we can take time for questions, you know. But I think what we might want to do is just begin by saying, what was the passion, in some ways, with which he uh, struggled during most of his life? And that passion really was one that many of us struggle with as well. People uh, in a university setting, yet at the same time, people of faith. How can we bring together the secular knowledge, scientific worldview, what that has to offer us with our own understanding of the mysteries of the Christian faith? And for him at that time, and it's amazing for us today as well, one of the major issues is how do we look at this question of creation and evolution. From my point of view, it's been solved many years ago. Teilhard wrote about it, you know, in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, yet we continue to reflect upon it and discuss it today. As if this whole theory of evolution, the awareness that reality is evolving, is somehow at odds with the notion that God created the universe. Basically, to make it kind of simple for a moment, what Teilhard ended up saying was that God created the universe, or let's say creates the universe. God creates the universe evolutively. In other words, God is creator, but evolution refers to how that creative activity comes across to us in time as we take a look at it, so that there's no contradiction. It's like two sides of a coin. A great insight of Teilhard's uh, was how he understood reality. And all of these things we can come back and pursue further if you want. But he always spoke about reality as having two faces, what he called the within and the without. And so basically there's, and the without refers to in a way the material, the physical, the observable, you know, the world that we can sense, study, that kind of a thing, and then the level of interiority. And as one of his best known books, known as The Human Phenomenon, he makes the point very clearly because he says that when evolution arrives at the point that humanity comes on the scene, then it becomes very obvious to us that there are these two sides, so to speak, the without, the bodily, the physical, all of this, but also in the human being, the human phenomenon, there's that level of the within, the interiority, the psychic, the spiritual, that side of us, and therefore in a way maybe postulating or extrapolating that what appears at one moment in evolution had to have a prehistory even if it wasn't completely observable before. An example, perhaps not the best one, but say that uh, someone you know who seems fine uh, on one day has, say, a, a psychic breakdown or even simply a physical kind of breakdown, a heart attack or something. The person looked fine, but suddenly that which had been going on inside now has become apparent on the outside. That within has manifested itself. So likewise, for evolution, Teilhard said that 
because interiority, a kind of psychism of some sort, has made its appearance there with the human phenomenon, it means that there was always its ancestors, if you will, and therefore all of reality has this within and the without. That there's no without without the within, and no within without the without. In other words, there are the two sides. And so if we look at the world in which we find ourselves, and we look at it for a moment from the viewpoint of the without, say we're looking at it empirically, observing it, studying it, you know, in terms of that which we can research in terms of the without, we would say the universe is evolving. Now, what does Teilhard mean by that? He gives the definition that he uses for evolution because it can be understood in a variety of ways. Evolution for him simply means everything that comes to be comes to be from something that was already there. In other words, everything that comes to be comes to be by way of birth from that which had been there before. So other than the initial, you might say, creative action, following that, everything that comes to be comes to be by way of being born from that which has been there before. And so if we look at our universe, and again he was studying it, you know, 50, 60 years ago, from the viewpoint of the without, the world is evolving. But if we look at it from the viewpoint of the within, we would say it is being created. From the without, it's evolving. From within, it's being created. In other words, evolution is God's creative activity expressed in time. There's no, in other words, opposition between the two. That evolution is God's creative activity expressed in that way. Now, he talks about it in a variety of ways besides this notion of the within and the without. He also talks about two basic kinds of energy uh, in the universe, what he calls tangential energies and radial energy. But tangential energies are the energies that we ordinarily study in science, physical kinds of energies, nuclear energy, chemical reactions, in other words, all of the tangential energies would be all of those that we might have access to uh, through scientific research. Radial energy is, however, what he sees as the energy of evolution, the push, the pull from within. For those of you who might have heard of or be familiar in any way with uh, the philosopher, the French philosopher who had some influence on Teilhard, uh, Henri Bergson, he spoke about like the élan vital, the kind of vital impulse, or one might even say some people today would use the expression the evolutionary impulse. In other words, that within the material universe that seems to propel it or push it or move it forward, that which evolves it in some ways. That's what radial energy is. It's more of a spiritual energy. You could begin by saying maybe a kind of psychic energy, but at an even deeper level, a spiritual energy. And in some ways, as one pushes it further, that might be a leap that we're taking, and again, we could come back to and reflect on, it's ultimately, from a Christian point of view, the Holy Spirit, or even we could say Christ. In other words, at the heart of the evolutionary process is God himself as evolver or the Holy Spirit as the source of an energy that moves evolution forward and upward. It's another kind of line that he uses, that, that the direction it takes is both upward and forward. To say only forward, you know, would be a kind of understanding of progress in some ways, whereby things evolve, but they don't have the same kind of connectedness maybe to, to God, to the above, to the spiritual source of all. But traditional Christian faith in some ways might have thought of, of uh, our relationship as only being vertical. You know, it's God and us. And so what Taylor wants to bring in is a horizontal dimension as well as the vertical dimension. That's why upward and forward. So 
basically all I said so far is that as he attempted to see the integration of these two realities, his faith in God as creator and his understanding of the world as evolving, he saw evolution as the phenomenal expression at the level of the without, the shape in a way that God's creative action takes. And so God creates the world evolutively. Evolution is God's creative action expressed phenomenally or in time. At the heart, the core, the within of this material world or the evolutionary process, there is an energy, ultimately an energy of God, the energy of evolution, a radial energy of the Holy Spirit that is the evolver, if you will. And in that sense, he also says in some places that ultimately that energy is love. And in a way, one could just stop and kind of ponder that to think that that, that which is at the core of the universe that's pushing it and pulling it upward and forward is love itself. We'll come back a little later and say a little more maybe about that. But let's then ask the question, all right, so the universe is evolving and it is being created. Where for Tayar does Christ fit into the picture? What about the relationship between Christ and evolution? And here again he makes what might appear at first a couple astounding statements, but they're not so untraditional as we might think. He talks about the relationship between Christ and creation. Now this is an evolving creation he's talking about, but it's the relationship between Christ and creation, the created world. And he sees a mutuality there, or if you want a complementarity, a way in which they mutually complete each other. Now let's see if we can get our minds for a moment around that. One might say, from a Christian perspective, that, okay, I could understand that in some way Christ brings the universe to completion, that Christ is in some ways at the heart of what evolution is, and that, that Christ raises it in some ways to another level beyond what we might ordinarily think. But he's also saying not only does Christ in a way complete evolution, but, or creation, but that creation completes Christ. That's maybe a little harder for us to immediately uh, resonate with, that the universe, the world, creation, brings something to Christ himself, completes Christ in such a way that Christ himself is incomplete apart from creation. Let's take an example, an analogy that you'd be much more familiar with and then come back to what Tayar is saying. And that analogy comes from St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, uh, really chapter 12, where he talks about the body of Christ. And, uh, and Tayar is actually very much influenced by Paul because we find in many of the Pauline letters uh, references to a cosmic dimension or to creation itself. So like in the letter to the Romans, Paul writes, all of creation is longing and groaning and in travail, waiting in a way for the redemption that awaits it. So there's in a way already in Paul he sees there. And then also in the letter to the Corinthians, the end of chapter 15, Paul also says that in the end, the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. And then, when that happens, Christ will hand everything over to the Father and God will be all in all, or God will be everything in everything. In other words, there's a, almost what you could say a panentheistic, not pantheistic, but everything in God and God in everything, almost a panentheistic kind of vision. And so he takes the lead from some of these texts from Paul and if one goes to that image then of the body of Christ, you might recall 
how uh, Paul speaks about we are all one body, you know, many members, uh, that there has to be the many in order for there to be the one, but the one is quite diverse, and the eye can't say to the ear, in some ways, what good are you? You can't see anything. The ear can't say to the nose, what good are you? You can't hear anything. It takes the many parts for there to be one, and we are all one body. And so likewise, if one follows that image through, you could say, well, what is the head, if we think of Christ as the head of the body, you know, that's the image again that Paul was using, just as in a way it takes the many, the head needs the body. So you can't have a head without the body, and you can't have Christ then without creation. Creation brings something to Christ. Christ as the head of creation, as the head of the body. So that's the sense behind this mutuality or reciprocity or complementarity that Christ completes creation, but creation also brings a completion to Christ. Now we might think this sounds outlandish, and in fact, Tayar was uh, at times silenced in his life by the Vatican because of some of the writings that were circulating, especially in connection with like original sin, that, that seemed like, well, how is this really compatible with Christian faith or not? But this particular point, which seems maybe rather uh, bold, you can even go to someone like Pius XII, uh, you know, way before the Second Vatican Council, who once said, strange as it may sound, Christ requires his members. Now, this is a very traditional thinking before the council person. It's strange though it may be, because the Christian insight is that there is this, this complementarity between that Christ isn't who he is apart from his body, and therefore apart from creation, which brings us to the notion we'll come back to in a second, the notion of a cosmic body. Christ's cosmic body. But before going there, to maybe just stay with this a little longer. In other words, uh, another way in which Teilhard talks about this evolving, creative action of God, he talks about it as in accord with what he calls the law of complexity consciousness. In other words, that, okay, the universe is evolving, but it also evolves in the direction of increased complexity. So what he calls complexification. Uh, atoms become molecules, molecules become megamolecular. In that megamolecular world, cells emerge, those become multicellular. In other words, there's, there's that growth of, of complexity. But also it's not only complexification, it's an increase of consciousness as well. And so, as, as the plant world and the animal world becomes more complex, uh, nervous systems develop, you know, a more complex brain, that there's an, also a growth in consciousness. So in some ways, evolution is the growth of complexity, but it's also an increase or a growth in consciousness, which we could come back and also reflect more upon because we are still evolving. <laughs> Uh, it's not as if, well, evolution has come to an end, that our own human phenomenon or human evolution is open-ended. And therefore, what does the growth in consciousness mean in some ways uh, for us as well? Because at this point, once we come to that stage of human evolution, the most significant aspect now is the unfolding evolution, if you will, of consciousness. So there are these stages in the evolutionary process. Uh, Teilhard uses these words, some of them he coins, but it starts out as like cosmogenesis. Uh, in other words, what is that? That's just the, the coming to be and the birth of and the evolution of the cosmos, you know, which today, you know, in terms of the universe and that kind of thing, people might document to an even greater degree than he ever would have considered. But then in that world of cosmogenesis, or in the cosmos, there emerges biogenesis at some point. The coming to be, the birth and the evolution of life, of living systems. 
And then at some point within biogenesis, there's what Teilhard calls neurogenesis or psychogenesis. The word he uses is more common based on the Greek word for mind, nous. In other words, there's the emergence of a deeper reality of a psychic structure of, of intellectual life, intelligent life, so that, that within that evolutionary process at certain points along the way there were tremendous leaps. Uh, and he describes these in different ways, like change of state, sometimes he uses, or sometimes a metamorphosis, you know, uh, a leap forward. Uh, which you get with the emergence of life, with the emergence of human life, that somehow it's the same, and yet that creative evolutionary process is significantly different. As that evolves from Teilhard's point of view, within that human world, or that world of neurogenesis, he speaks then about Christogenesis, the emergence or birth of the Christ. And so that just as the cosmos gave birth to life, and life gave birth to thought, within that thinking world, that human world, gave birth to the Christ. And so he, which today many maybe would look at it in a rather strange way, but he certainly saw Christ is there at the core and at the center uh, of the evolutionary process. And so now as it continues, what's happening is the continuing evolution of the Christ. In other words, Christ is still in the process himself of being completed or being formed. Christ himself is incomplete. Now all of these might be statements, you know, that you might want to stick in the back of your mind and we can come back and reflect upon further but basically to see that, that it's not only creation and evolution, but that this evolving, creative world, uh, we find at the core of it and within it, Christ. Uh, but Christ in relationship to the whole cosmos. To maybe take that notion, I just referred to it briefly earlier, the notion of the cosmic Christ. Don't know if you've ever heard that expression, although, again, if one goes back to St. Paul, or even to many of the early Greek fathers in the church, it wouldn't be something so strange. But in modern times, it's like it had, had disappeared. Um, and basically, what's being emphasized is that, that Christ's humanity is so tied in with the world that when we think of the human nature of Christ or the humanity of Christ, we tend to just think of, well, there it was, that person, Jesus, somehow there in history, without realizing how intimately tied through that humanity he is with the whole universe. Let me give a couple of things that might help us to, to come to grips with that. Uh, today, many of us, and based on much of the research even in modern science and even say quantum physics and those kinds of things, we tend to think of all of our lives and in fact all of reality is very much entangled or interconnected so that we are not who we are apart from one another. Okay? So I am not who I In fact, Teilhard in a very brief essay once entitled, What Exactly is the Human Body? about a four-page essay, what exactly is the human body? He says, my body is not this portion of the universe that I possess totally, but the totality of the universe that I possess partially. In other words, my body isn't simply this flesh and these bones. My bodiliness isn't just this this is my body, this is my space, that's your space, and that's your body. My body isn't just this portion of the universe that I possess totally, but the totality of the universe that is mine partially. In other words, in one way, in the end, there's only one body, but many focal centers or points, if you want, within it to kind of come to grips with that, because it comes back again to what Paul is saying in some ways. Let me give a, ask a question. If you think for a moment 
say, is someone who's very close to you, perhaps the closest, dearest, most caring person about whom you care the most, love the most, or whatever in your life, and you had a choice to make between letting go of that person, whether through death, separation, whatever it might be, or having amputated the thumb on your right hand, what choice would you make? It's either to have this thumb amputated or to lose the person who means the most to you. Well, hopefully, if I were the person who meant a lot to you, you'd say you'd let go of the thumb, as difficult and dramatic as that would be. But what we become aware of in some ways is that the emotional amputation from the loss of that loved one can be more significant because we can sense that person to be even more a part of me than some of these so-called physical parts of me, as important or intimate or a part of me. That, and therefore, literally, we are not who we are apart from one another. That, that in terms of that, 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 what does it mean to be a person? It's to be the center of a network of relationships. So who is Don Gergen? He's not this flesh and these bones that occupies this space. But to know Don Gergen in the end means to know parents, family, friends, from where he comes. And eventually, that process of, of almost socialization, which eventually can't just stop. We'll say, well, yes, it's this community that's my body, or it's, it's, it's the human family that's my body. No, eventually, it's, it's the whole cosmos that's my body. This is my body. We might start with, this is my body. But then, no, this is my body. The whole human, this is my body. The whole cosmos event. So that each of us has a cosmic body, as well as what we might think of as just this more physically confined body. And if that is true, coming back to Christ, then also Christ is not who he is apart from his body. That Christ, too, has a cosmic body, the cosmic body of Christ. Uh, Teilhard also uses another expression that we might fit in here, uh, the expression omega. In other words, omega is the Greek word that kind of refers to the end, uh, from alpha to omega. And so he sees Christ as that toward which all of evolution is moving, in which evolution culminates. In the end, it is Christ's body. It is Christ who's in the process of being formed. Christ himself. So that kind of connection, if you will, between creation and evolution, creation is, is God's evolutionary work, Evolution is God's creative activity. And in that evolving universe, God's creative universe, Christ has his place as the one that in a way draws the universe towards its conclusion as Christ himself is in the process of being formed. Christ himself is evolving. Well, let's ask the question, what might some of the implications of this be for our own lives, our own spirituality? Uh, we might begin to think that there may be some obvious things. In other words, one would be, Teilhard clearly takes very seriously the world in which we find ourselves. So there are some traditional spiritualities that we might describe in some way as more like world negating. You know, that they didn't value the world. It's as if maybe the whole goal of Christian life is to get out of the world. You know, that it's the afterlife or future life, those kinds of things. But Teilhard sees very significant value then in the world because it's not just God or the world, 
God or creation, but what? God and the world, God and creation. And therefore, human action and human activity have a significant role to play because we are partners in this evolutionary process, which is God's creative work. And so it's God and we who are, if you want to put it that way, like co-evolvers. So the whole question of our commitment to the world, to the transformation of this earth, there's a great passage towards the end of one of his better known writings, also known as the Divine Milieu, uh, which he wrote already in 1927, in which he says how easy it is for us to kind of lose hope. Uh, and one of the kind of criticisms at times of Teilhard's worldview is that he tends to be too optimistic. You know, we could come back and talk about that too. Uh, is it a naively optimistic way? Of, of looking at things, but basically he feels that in some ways Christians had lost their capacity to stir up hope in the fact that this world itself has a future. In other words, it's not just a question of another world, but the future of this world as well. So one of the implications for us is to realize that what we do in our daily lives, whatever our professional lives might be, uh, another one of his essays was once entitled Research, Work, and Worship. Now, what do they have in common? From Teilhard's point of view, that how we build the earth, another title of one of his essays, Building the Earth, how we contribute to the transformation of the world, that that itself is an act of worship in its own way or study, research, that too contributes to building the earth, and therefore in some ways as important as prayer is, and for him it was an extremely important reality, and we could come then and talk more about the contemplative dimension there in his thought, but also important is our own human endeavor, our human activities, whether that be research, any other kind of professional, what is the contribution that, that that makes. So in that sense, it's a, it gives rise to a spirituality that we could say is much more this worldly in that way, takes the earth seriously. Another uh, aspect of his spirituality, maybe it's saying that same thing in a little different way, is that it's very incarnational. In other words, Incarnation implies in some ways that uh, God himself so loved or so befriended the earth, us, material reality, that God chose to become entangled with it himself. In other words, in the incarnation, from a Christian point of view, we have that sense that, or that belief that somehow God, or we might say the second person of the Trinity, if you will, uh, has immersed himself so in the material world that, that our view is incarnational, immersing ourselves also in that universe and therefore from within helping that universe itself to unfold. So maybe let's just stop for a second. I'll make a summary statement or so, and then you just maybe will take 30 seconds of silence for you to pull some of it together, and then I'll go on and say a few other things, and then we can move to questions. So, the world in which we find ourselves is evolving, but that evolution is a manifestation of God's action. God's creative activity. So God is giving birth to and evolving the world in which we find ourselves. A world which is moving in the direction of increased complexity and increased consciousness. And within that continually movement upward and forward 
eventually as a part, if you will, of that evolutionary process or God's creation, there emerges within it the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who's now brought that whole process from Tayar's point of view to a whole new level, a new stage, Christogenesis, Christification, you know, cosmogenesis, biogenesis, anthropogenesis, if you will, Christogenesis. And so now Christ is there, and it's not only then that the Christ has brought something to that evolving creation, but that that evolving creation is also completing Christ as it moves more and more towards his completion, that omega point uh, to which we all contribute because indeed that universe is our body. This is in the end who we are. We are all one in that way with God and God being one with us. So a commitment both to God and to the value of the world. So it's movement out of any kind of either or way of putting it, creation or evolution, science or religion, the world or God. For Teilhard, these are deeply integrated so that that kind of integration is at the core of how eventually he saw things. And so although it's grounded in science and in his faith, in some ways it's as much of a vision, a mystic vision, if you will. In fact, as he opens the writing, the human phenomenon, he talks about it more as being a seer, one who sees. Uh, he says this basically, the opening preface is entitled Voir, to see. This is how he sees what's going on. So let's just take 30 seconds maybe of quiet for you to see, if you can, some of what he saw and how you resonate with it. Okay, you just come back and maybe emphasize or add one further thing and then we can see where you'd like to go with some questions. I mentioned earlier this notion of ultimately the energy that drives or evolves uh, creatively this universe as being love the energy of love. And in one of his essays, again, he says, what will happen if mankind sometime discovers the tremendous power of love? It'll be like rediscovering, in a sense, fire on the earth, that kind of thing. So that love. But to say a little more about how he sees that, that maybe three things to just say there. On the one hand, Love is a drive toward a force for union. In other words, the evolutionary process, insofar as it's driven by love, is not only, if you want, complexification, consciousness, but it's also a process of unification. Deeper and deeper, not just piling things together at the level of the without, but that deep at the level of the within and then he finds examples of that, whether it's, you know, uh, atoms coming together to form a molecule, whether it's electrons coming together, those forces of, of attraction already there, or within the human sphere, the human world in some ways, uh, the, the love, the friendship, marriage, sexuality plays a significant role in his own reflection. Uh, in other words, what is sexuality within that context as well? It's a very integral aspect of this evolutionary process because, again, it's that which pushes or pulls us together from something deeper within ourselves, ultimately. And so, so there's that 
unification as a facet of what it means to talk about love at the heart of the universe. But then it sounds as if, or it could sound as if, well, it's just bringing together and it's the loss of individuality or the loss of personality in some ways. Uh, is it just a drive towards union? And he comes with an axiom that many others have referred to since in different ways. He speaks, union differentiates. In other words, true union, true unity, isn't that which just brings us together at the level of the without, but that true unity completes, perfects, individualizes, personalizes, at the same time that it brings us into union with others. In other words, there's a difference between individuality, if you will, or an individualism, and personality. He says our persons are only completed when we are brought together with others by something deep within ourselves. So that true union not only completes, but it differentiates ourselves. So it's not as if you and I enter more intimately into union with each other and the universe as well, that, that somehow individuality is lost. No, individuality is retained because it takes love itself to complete that which it brings together. So one is love unites, but it also unites by differentiating at the same time that it unites. That in a way my person is completed by being brought not by over against each other, but only in union with each other. And in that process, another facet of love is the recognition of the dignity of that individuality. In other words, letting the other be. Sometimes we tend to think of, of union, you know, or even we can think of it in human relationships, sexual relationships, human love, but we can also think of it in terms of mystical union, union with God, or in whatever way, it's almost as if we might well, lose our own identity in the process. But what Teilhard is saying, that another aspect of love is that it so respects the other that it desires the freedom of the other. And so love both unites and sets free. And that's the challenge and the miracle, to let you be you, while at the same time we become more and more deeply a part of each other. And so that we could say more about how he sees that process of what he calls personalization, the movement from my identity as individual towards union with others in the process of which my individuality is not destroyed but really completed because it comes to completion in being a person and that to be a person means to be the center again of a network of relationships. And so that that driving ultimate energy in the universe moves the universe towards union, but also towards freedom, and also towards then differentiation. So that what unfolds as time unfolds is greater and greater manifestation of the, the multiplicity that the universe is. Okay, I think we maybe should just stop there uh, and kind of pick up with some observations or questions and then we can take a short little break and continue in case some people want to take off. Yes? Sure. Uh, my question is about the human condition. You know, we all suffer, we all die. And uh, the tradition just seems to sort of say, well, God didn't mean to be that way. You know, and they, so they go back and say, well, it's because we messed it up, you know, in original sin. Um, you know, with evolution, I mean, it seems like animals have been suffering and dying for a long time. And so all I can think of like you're here that. Yeah, a couple things I could say, and that was one of the challenging aspects of his thinking about this in terms of how he might connect that with uh, orthodox Christian thought and faith. Um, maybe a couple things. First, to see the human condition or human sinfulness or whatever, to put it in the evolutionary context, is first of all 
it reflects the unfinishedness of creation. So all of the things that you in a way have mentioned show that we are not yet done, that it is an evolving reality and therefore we could emphasize where it's going, where it's come from, but we could also emphasize it ain't yet, the unfinishedness of creation itself. The second thing you would then say is uh, that it's, it's almost in terms of statistical probability, let's say, it's most highly probable that in a universe that's unfinished, that what we call evil will enter into the scene. And so that, he would say, God could not create a universe without evil or suffering. So that the choice that's there, if you want to put it that way, is no creation at all, or if God freely chooses. But that's not so totally different uh, from parents who choose to have children. That you know when you decide to have children that you're not giving birth to people who will have a pain-free life. But somehow you have the sense that that suffering, or you hope that that suffering or pain will be so redeemed that somehow the time will come when they will say it is still better to have been than not to have been at all. And so in a way the evolutionary process is, is that. But then when we get especially to the notion of Adam, Eve, and sin, and that kind of thing, just as the process is evolving, so when it comes to the human stage, you have not only the kind of evil you referred to earlier, you know, say you had natural disasters before humanity ever came on the scene, death was there before it ever came on the scene, suffering in the animal world before human beings ever came on the scene. But nevertheless, when human beings do come on the scene, it's almost as if there's also with moral evil, which is a new kind of evil, a kind of conscious and morally freely chosen evil. In other words, there's a dramatic leap forward in terms of, and that's why we would maybe call it moral evil rather than maybe physical evil or sin rather than just evil and that's it. So that there is a reality to, from our origins, if you will, once humanity enters on the scene, a new kind of evil. And then he would say that uh, in terms of, again, progress or that kind of thing, it's not as if we are more moral than our ancestors. Sometimes we think we've made in evolution a lot of progress. That itself is a word we should put in quotes for a moment. But to some degree it's true. When you look at the advances in medicine, you look at the advances in technology, you look at food production today, that in fact food production today we probably could feed everybody in the world so that there wouldn't be starvation. I mean there's a lot that's happened that none of us would want to go back to, you know, even in a romantic moment three centuries ago. But that has also involved the evolution of our human capacity for sin or for harm or for evil. Take nuclear energy, nuclear bomb, Nagasaki. In other words, we are, so we're not necessarily, scarily, more moral than people 20 centuries ago. But we have the capacity to do more good than we ever did before in human history because of, of what's available to us now. So we have a capacity for greater good, but also a capacity for greater destruction than ever before. So there is a reality to this sin, which is with us from our origins almost, that as we look back, as soon as there was human freedom, there was a whole new ball game in some ways in terms of how evolution is being affected by it. So original sin would be for him that capacity for evil that has been with us ab origine, from our origins. It's not simply something that Adam and Eve did, but that they do represent or manifest, because in a sense you already find in that story the human kind of pull towards a certain kind of, let's say, hubris or pride or something of that sort. So that, those would be some things. We could talk more about it if you want, but to maybe 
you know, so he struggled with it. Now, whether that from a traditional Catholic or the Vatican's point of view would be adequate, you know, was another a question. But that's how he would, would kind of situate human moral evil and suffering. And then also, keeping in mind that because of that, at our point in history, it's now much more difficult to distinguish these two sides, these, you say, the pre-moral evil, if you will, and moral evil, because things that happen, there was disease in the world before humanity came on the scene. But now we have a much greater capacity to respond to those diseases, and we've learned a lot about. But also when we don't choose to do so, or we don't, say, provide health care in a certain way, or whatever it might be, are some of the disasters that we look at actually a consequence of the history of human immorality or human choices, human selfishness? So now it gets more and more difficult to separate out because maybe thousands of people die sometimes of starvation. Well, death was here before. Species went out of existence. But now those realities can't simply be attributed to nature alone, because even that is now a consequence of, of how we choose to or not choose to use our capacity for doing the good that's possible, back here and then up here. Uh, I'm starting to understand why you're introduced as a great communicator. Uh. Uh, you know, you're talking about the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church and the Well, I'd agree with much of what you say except the last sentence. Um, maybe, I mean, that's an evaluative statement. It would seem to me one could also put it this way, that as we grow in our human knowledge and we attempt to integrate that more and more with what we deeply believe, say in terms of faith in God, that there is a God, well then how do we integrate what could be so disparate, what maybe centuries ago would have seemed irreconcilable, but now as we look at it, there's no reason why science and religion necessarily had to go in their separate directions, except that each one, in its own way, got stuck, say, in a particular world view that it was unwilling to compromise or build a bridge toward, and so that science more and more saw its own way of discovery as being almost infallible and therefore it had no need for what other people felt as in a deeply religious way as, as something not to be let go of. So there was compromise, there is that kind of thing, but it wouldn't seem to me that it cheapens necessarily one or the other, it deepens each one. So that now the religious perspective, as it's always been true, probably, in every major period of history, as a new world view emerged, or as consciousness evolved, the challenge was how now to rethink that facet of faith in light of, aha, but also the challenge to science in a way to see that modern science or Newton or any of these isn't the end of the evolutionary process and that 200 years from now, a thousand years from now, people might look back, as already some do, say to Newton and say, we thought he had all the answers and in the 19th century we certainly thought progress, 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 we're moving almost in a utopian way towards so, in a way, science had to be humbled, religion has to be humbled, and in it, it sees that there has to be a deeper 
kind of collaboration, if you will. And in the process, there could be some cheapening or something of this sort, but ultimately it's in order to come to a deeper synthesis, a deeper insight into the fact that, that we are one and that both of these are avenues to profound truths that are not incompatible with each other. In addition to that, um, at the time of Teilhard and early thoughts on evolution, the, the big thing was survival of the fittest, but more and more now we're seeing altruism as another, um, another product of evolution. And so at the time it might have been a little bit harder to mesh them, but they're starting to look more and more like each other. Mm -hmm. It's true, certainly like if we go back to Darwin and Huxley and everyone at that time, uh, it would appear as if the Christian view was ridiculous if this is true and that the Christian view maybe became defensive in the light of and so it's like everything has its season or its timing that it would take time before one might see mm, these aren't ultimately incompatible, you know, in terms of the ways they can be integrated and understood. You know, Dishardin is often described as a, as a mystic and a theorist and someone who can reconcile science and evolution with faith. But usually not described as a theologian. As a matter of fact, uh, in fact, he's missing the fact that he wasn't a theologian. You know, and after his death, he was finally published in one too many of his books. Was there anyone working on a theology that would sort of put together Well, a couple of things. Uh, there is a man at Georgetown, a theologian, John Hout, H-A-U-G-H-T. I think his most recent book was God After Darwin. You wouldn't necessarily agree with everything in the book, but he's doing a lot of... Now, it's not like he's Teilhardian, totally. I mean, he would bring in other, you know, but he's working in, the, in that same vein. And there are certainly many others out there still working with a Teilhardian view say someone, this gets a little more complex in that sense, but Thomas Berry, who's done a lot of ecological thinking, is, was highly indebted to the thought of Tayar. So many people who are, would be working with it may have moved beyond where Tayar himself was, but still spurred on to a great degree by a lot of... Now, another thing to just say, this more be more on a humorous or frivolous vein, but uh, it's the point you start out by making, is he a theologian? Uh, and you remember when I was in college, I won't tell you when that was, but in the, say in 1962, I think, is when actually the first writings of Teilhard came out in English. You know, so say 1963, 64, people were beginning to really be taken with this thought. Uh, and some would say, yeah, it's, it's visionary, but it's not really solid philosophy. Or it's compatible with Christianity, but it's not theological. Others would say it's not great science, even though just his scientific writings come to maybe about 11 volumes, you know, just in terms of paleontology and all of those kinds of things. Anyway, this one professor and I were having a kind of an argument, and he gave what's been for me a great insight and it might even come back to what you were saying about you know the synthesis the value of a synthesis you know maybe it loses something in trying to do that and it gains something in trying to do that but he said when he was a kid he had gone to a carnival where he saw a clown standing on his head juggling and he was just fascinated and then when he went home and kind of realized what it was that was so fascinating, he realized that he'd seen better clowns, better jugglers, and better acrobats. But he'd never seen someone do all three. And I would say there's an insight into Teilhard there. There are better scientists, better philosophers, better theologians. But his appeal is the fact that he really was able to do all three. Maybe he wasn't the world's greatest metaphysician 
or the most rational theologian, but he knew theology. You know, also, uh, this might get a little aside, but you might know or not know the name of Henri de Lubac. De Lubac was one of the significant post-Vatican II theologians who wrote a lot before Vatican II, would be, have seen as a progressive, although after Vatican II, eventually he might have been seen much more, you know, conservative in, say, in contrast to someone like Ron or that kind of a thing. De Lubac wrote at least three books just on Tayar, one on the religion of Tayar, one on the notion of the feminine in Tayar, and another much more of a popular one in Tayar's Catholicism in some ways. So there were theologians who took him seriously, and theologians, in a sense, who dismissed him as utterly just too either simplistic or unorthodox or that. So it depends upon, like, the vision to see, but I think the appeal comes in our own day and age, where science and, and knowledge has become so specialized, you know, that it gets fragmented, how do we bring together? Uh, does it cheapen? Does it, in the synthesis, in some way, enlighten? Does it enrich? And so there are theologians who would not be confined, you know, to just his own insights, but... Uh, even it's amazing, you know, because the Catholic Church felt uncomfortable with him in many ways for 30, 40 years, although de Lubac, an utterly orthodox theologian, defended him all the way along. Uh, recently, you might have heard, I think it was last July, actually, Pope Benedict quoted him, you know, in a, and of course, Pope Benedict is known in one way as being much more ecologically conscious and much more in terms of a theology of creation. So you'll find different people coming back to an insight that he has, has generated, but perhaps going beyond him or taking him further here and then over there. Is there a place for sacrament in this understanding of things? Two things I'll say, uh, yes. The first is, in a way, it's a very sacramental view of the universe. In other words, basically, what is a sacrament? Uh, that it's the within made visible. And so in the contemporary way, sometimes we speak of Christ as like the, the sacrament of God, and the church as the sacrament of Christ. And this, you know, so basically that notion of almost it's like incarnational or sacramental, that, that the within is expressed through the without, and therefore we do come to God through matter. You might remember some Catholics traditionally, and many today, would use the expression in terms of Mariology or Marian spirituality, ad Jesum per Mariam, to Jesus through Mary. Uh, in the divine milieu, Tayar used the expression ad Jesum per Mundum, to Jesus through the world. In other words, the world itself. But then the second, because we could say more about each of these things, is a lot that he had to say about the Eucharist. Because in one place, when he was in China for many years, and really was a scientific and by and large, mainly, say, atheistic scientific community, uh, he chose to say Mass, but he had no bread, no wine. So there's this essay he wrote called The Mass on the World. In fact, that's one of the images that Pope Benedict has recently quoted, how the whole universe someday will be seen as a host. That is, the universe is that which will be offered to Christ. Here it is, that the whole universe will have been transubstantiated or transformed. So there's a lot there that one could say more in terms of, of the Eucharist, because he saw that as, in a way, symbolic of or exemplary of what the whole evolutionary process is. In other words, in some ways, it's just one grand process of transubstantiation of the cosmos becoming the body of Christ in that way. Yes?
A mm -hmm. um, couple things, you know, and all of these we could spend more time on, but there is probably, I can't speak as a biologist in that way, some validity in the notion of the survival of the fittest. In other words, to some degree, that will survive, which has adapted itself sufficiently to, you know, make its survival secure. So we don't want to, again, just kind of, and that's, in fact, that book, God After Darwin, uh, one of the points he wants to make is that Darwinism doesn't necessarily have to mean atheism. You know, that in other words, even though, depending on how Darwinian one might be, he will more or less accept much of Darwin and go on from there to show how that is integral to or integrated with the possibility of the Catholic faith. But then the added dimension that you're bringing is, again, that that's only a partial picture. In other words, it's not the whole story. Uh, I have a friend that died a couple years ago who liked to say, it's hard to see the whole picture when you're inside the frame. And we're trying to see a bigger picture, not necessarily a unified field thing where we'll see everything, but that we're trying to see a bigger picture. And one of the dangers of modern science is it thought it had the whole picture, and to the degree that it doesn't get the whole picture, it still thinks it's maybe the only picture going without realizing that there are other facts. So that even you'll find, say, in, in psychology and places like that today, you know, studies into the role of of affinity, you know, of empathy, of all of these kinds of... So clearly they have a strong role to play. Now what Teilhard would say is that with Christogenesis, that is, with the Christ, and we'd have to say a lot more about what that even would involve, but that with that coming to be, love is also brought more explicitly, just like the human phenomenon brings intelligence and freedom to the forefront where even though there would have been consciousness in the universe even prior to its emergence in the human scheme, so that there's a kind of rudimentary consciousness in the animal world, more rudimentary in the plant world, you can push it back in that kind of a way, that just as thought comes full scale with the human phenomenon, with the Christic phenomenon, if you will, what comes even fuller scale, what, what Christ brings, is he ushers love into the universe in a more explicit way, which doesn't mean it wasn't there before. It certainly would have been there before, but the whole Judeo-Christian tradition in that sense is, one could say, a love story in its own way of God's love for the... And therefore, one of the benefits of, one of the contributions of, say, the religious dimension or the spiritual phenomenon, and he has an essay entitled The Phenomenon of Spirituality, is the fact that uh, we cannot discount today that, one, the reality of moral evil as being something that's had a whole leap forward in terms of the potential for disaster, but also, if you want, the supernatural, or that whole world has been brought to the forefront, re-energized in a way through... Uh, through the Christian message or the Christian view. So uh, I don't know, we could pursue that a little further if that kind of gets at, but certainly that one cannot, one cannot say therefore the only mechanism at work in the evolutionary process is Darwinian natural selection. But that doesn't discount that it plays a role, but the danger is to see it as the be all and end all of. But if one sees evolution is God's creative action expressed in time, then there are other mechanisms also at work. And from a Christian point of view, one of those mechanisms would be the Holy Spirit is there at work and cannot be discounted, which doesn't mean that God doesn't also work through that process of natural selection. But God is not confined to working through the mechanisms of natural selection alone. Yes, oh, here, here and here, and then we maybe we'll just stop and see how much longer we should go.
couple of things to just say. Um, one, it depends on whether you approach the question as a believer or as a Christian. And so in some ways, that's something of an assumption that's there with Tayar, not that he wouldn't try to you know, bring someone to that belief in some ways. So it's a question of how do, then it's how do we see God acting through these, what traditionally we would call secondary causes, or acting through these natural, you know, causes and all of that kind of thing. But it is affirming, like, uh, the, the reality of spirit, the reality of immaterial forces, the reality of an energy that is in no way what we might ordinarily think of as material or physical. And if there is, now someone could say, well, I have no need of that hypothesis kind of thing. Well, then that's another question, why we might want to lead you to come to see that, in fact, your hypothesis is also lacking in certain areas. You know, and we get into that discussion as to, whether you do need it. But if we start with like that there is a spiritual reality, then, then there is an energy, if we want to use that word, there is a reality at work in the universe that's more subtle, uh, deeper, uh, less immediately comprehensible than we might immediately think. And so how do we get at that? Well, we, we don't know exactly how that might work, how it might fit in, but we do know that if God is there, or the Holy Spirit, or however you want to put it, that uh, at the core of this is God's creative presence to that which is unfolding. And you'd have to then get into kind of like a spirituality in which, say, Augustine might say something like, you know, our hearts are restless until they rest, that there's something deep inside, or at the core of things, there is the natural desire for God, for completion, that if we indeed have been structured, created in some ways for God, for the beatific vision, well then God as Omega is luring us toward that finality which might exceed even our knowledge of it so that even before we were aware of it because of revelation or even before there was humankind that God had already created the universe to be one. And so it's just in that there is an energy at work as nebulous as that may sound, and then one would get into mysticism and some of those kinds of things. Uh, so how that works through the natural causes might be another question, but that God uses these uh, as God's way of acting in the world would be, you know, a, a legitimate way of speaking at least.
subjective wonders, as I suppose, that have to do with not the intellectual, not the intellectual discussion, which is all very important. Lord, I'm married to it. I can tell you that much. But uh, the, the, the fact that love um, has to do with the state of allowance. My thought, you know, I don't know what you thought about evolution and so forth. Um, this, is this contradictory in a very simple way that the Bible says that Day or whatever it was, God created man for sex, you know, and there's the end. But now, it, how, how does this, you, you spent the whole course here discussing evolution and so forth, but how am I going to go out and say now to somebody that's going to say now that God didn't create man just in one day, he's got, we're still busy evolution. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, how, how, how do I respond in a way that I feel comfortable with? It says, you know what? What it says in the Bible. It's dead accurate. It was day six or whatever the day was. Mm -hmm. Or now mm -hmm. we're still busy evolution. Which one has it? Well, two things to say. Um, it's true that the bigger the picture, and in the way I said earlier, you, it's hard to see the whole picture. The wider the vision, the bigger the picture. Some of the daily contacts, how I reach out to you in the midst of your suffering or the fact that etc doesn't seem immediately to fit but that's just because we're looking at a bigger picture but we can narrow it down and narrow it down and in fact the way I respond to you is a mention of and an important facet in the whole evolutionary process but that wasn't I mean I could talk more about what some of the criticisms of Tayar have been and you know that could easily be one that people would see that that in a way he was sometimes less concerned even with historical epochs. I could talk about the evolution of consciousness in certain, you know, periods of history, different world views, but I can remember a uh, uh, history professor once in, in conversation saying that, well, uh, it just seems to me that, and he would be very aware of historical events, historical contingency, and if this hadn't happened, if you know, Napoleon had died younger, the whole, you know, world would, well, what do you do with all of these kind of contingent events in that kind of a way? And so he was not so concerned with, like, Teilhard's grand cosmic vision from, as a historian, but one could also say to him, from Teilhard's point of view, you know, that history can have a very narrow point of view, that, that, that history's, human history's only been around in terms of the whole story of evolution for a very brief amount of time. So basically all I'm saying there is that yes, we are talking about something that might not get to the existential questions that tomorrow you and I are going to struggle with. On the other hand, what you're going to say to someone who interprets the Bible very differently uh, might depend on how uh, open or totally closed that person is. You might not break through at all. But these would be the Bible does not teach history, although it contains history. It doesn't teach science, although it contains certain important facts about the world in which we live. Now, someone might not be ready to accept that. Well, then one has to discuss that further. But the story of creation in the book of Genesis is neither a scientific account nor a historical account. It's an effort for God's revelation, if you want, to break through and help us understand, one, that at the source of all is a reality that's beyond our comprehension, whatever you want to call that God, and that when human beings came on the scene, that that was in some ways a tremendous advance in terms of what God's doing in creation, but it also in many ways was a fall along with it because of what emerges there with humanity. And so that story of Adam and Eve is not to be discounted as not true, but the kind of truth it contains isn't cosmological, paleontological, if I said to the person, uh, 
and I don't know what the person would reply, but say, uh, I have a heart condition. I have heart disease. Uh, would you recommend to me that I go tomorrow to see a cardiologist or a theologian to help me? Both might have something to offer. The theologian might have some profound spiritual help or wisdom, but in fact, the theologian or the Bible isn't necessarily going to have the expertise to do the heart catheterization or something of this sort. In other words, the people have to begin to see the kind of material or literature or, or what the Bible is about. And it's communicating spiritual knowledge. It's communicating spiritual wisdom. It's communicating something that God wants to communicate to us. But it's not history. And it's not, therefore, necessarily in conflict with. Now, insofar as one interprets that story and says there is no God, uh, or there's no ultimate value to the universe, or we're living in a meaningless universe, where we're just, in a sense, whirling around in space, you know, alien in that regard. Well, then you'd say that conflicts not with the story, but with the spiritual wisdom of God's wanting to communicate to us, I am, I am with you, I love you, and this creation is there for you, and the universe is behind you, and you have a destiny ahead of you, beyond compare. So there doesn't have to. So in a way, I mean, but whether that person would be convinced if they think, you know, well, I'm denying the truth of the Bible, it might end up in a stalemate. But basically, you can communicate to the person that the kind of truth one finds there is not incompatible with truth that comes from other disciplines. Doesn't mean that that which comes from another discipline might be proven in a hundred years or two years false. Newtonian physics has been discovered to not be the be-all and end-all and bottom line final word. But anyway, as a religious person, we ought not enter into discussion whereby we assume we know it all, but neither should someone assume that it has to be literally in touch with the words of the Bible without understanding what the Bible is trying to communicate. I would say it's beyond 8.30, so I don't know, we maybe should bring it toward a close. But thank you very much for your having come. <laughs>